At this point, we're ready to go. Um, I'm very here. I'm going to kill my own uh, video for a second as well. Um, oh, hold on, one more person. Excellent. Um, so, everyone, welcome to our our second uh, installment of the our uh, our uh, Lenten spirituality series on the great traditions, spiritual traditions of our. Uh, Western Catholic Church. Uh, our speaker tonight is our own uh, parochial vicar, one of our own parochial vicars, Father Ignatius Schweitzer. Um, and Father Ignatius is, for those who've gotten to hear his homilies or partake in his Bible studies or anything else, no, he's uh, deeply imbued with the sense of our Catholic spirituality. Uh, he, has, he has studied um, Carmelite spirituality in particular. He teaches for the Avila Institute. Uh, online courses on Catholic spirituality. And so without further ado, I'm going to kill my own microphone and hand it over. Father Ignatius, it is all yours. Okay, thank you, Father John Paul. Um, and so yeah, we might as well begin with prayer, right? That'd be a good place to begin. So let's um, turn first to our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And gracious God and Father, we approach you um, so blessed, uh, so happy to be your adopted sons and daughters. Help this talk uh, to show us how we can draw closer to you, how we can grow in a deeper prayer, how we can uh, draw closer to your heart, through your son Jesus, and through your spirit. Um, and may it show us a way forward in our own prayer lives. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I have a PowerPoint presentation to uh, accompany this. So let me, uh, oh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, okay, hold on a second. Sure. Uh, Let's hit make co-host. Did you, uh, do you have that now as co-host status? Uh, I'm not sure where to find that status. Oh, okay. yeah, I must. Yeah, well, yeah, I can now. I got yeah. it. I got okay. it. Great, Excellent. great, great, great. Okay, we're all set. We're all set. Okay, people can see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so this, uh, this term about a contemplative revolution, uh, it's not my own term. Um, there's a diocesan priest, Father Donald Haggerty, who's been writing some books the past uh, eight to 10 years on the contemplative life, on contemplative prayer. He has a nice little trilogy now, uh, beginning with contemplative provocations. The second volume was contemplative hunger, and then last year, uh, he came out with contemplative enigmas. But they're nice. They're nice little aphorisms or paragraphs about contemplative prayer. Um, and he is really kind of a for, he's on the, the forefront of kind of being an expert on, on prayer. Uh, I've heard people who went on retreats with him and just have marvelous things to say about him. He teaches at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, uh, Maryland. And is also at the Cathedral of New York City uh, when he's not uh, at the seminary. But in these uh, books on contemplative prayer, he suggests that we're in the middle of a contemplative revolution. There's a contemplative revolution going on. Uh, many people are turning to, uh, to quiet prayer, to uh, making that time for the Lord in silent prayer. And he sees it as transforming souls, but also transforming the face of the church. So let me give you a quotation from uh, Father Donald Haggerty. From, this is from his 2016 book, Contemplative Hunger, and he says, can a contemplative revolution take place in the church? Namely, a significant turn among many souls to the fundamental importance of silent prayer and hours alone before the gaze of God. We might ask if this phenomenon is true today. Cloisters and monasteries show no noticeable influx of candidates. 
On the other hand, solitary souls of spiritual intensity seem to be increasing all the time. Souls of, intern souls of intense yearning for God seem to be making their influence felt more and more in the church today. And precisely because they are often souls who make a greater contribu a contribution to active works as well. These people seem to be finding their way to God and to hours of silent prayer, even in places that are less congenial for deeper spiritual living. They are a spiritual phenomenon of the current day in the church. So note, as Father Haggerty speaks of this contemplative revolution, he realizes, he recognizes the fact that monasteries aren't showing any, you know, intense increase in vocations. Uh, and, you know, they did not too long ago after the Second World War, there was an influx of monastic vocations to the Trappists and, and so forth. Uh, but nothing like that is happening now. Uh, but he does, just from his contact with souls, his contact speaking to people, he does think there is a contemplative revolution happening in our church now. And it's among the laity, primarily. It's among uh, other places that might not be, as he says, congenial uh, to solitary prayer, not as congenial as like a monastery. Uh, we might think of the missionaries of charity or something among the religious, but you know, members of every religious order, um, and then among the laity too. Um, so yeah, this contemplative revolution, it does seem like something is happening along these lines. I've heard it argued too that St. John Paul II, so this is an argument that Dr. Anthony Lillis makes uh, in his book, Fire from Above. And I think this book is taking this chapter from another uh, source that he, he wrote this for another source or he, a talk he gave. But he says that uh, John Paul II's uh, trip to Denver uh, on World Youth Day, what was it, like 1994 or so, somewhere around there, that uh, that did spark something in the church in America. And he, uh, he argues that that sparked something like uh, a contemplative revolution. That's still going on. That's still uh, gaining momentum. And so let's do, um, let's look at what St. John Paul II says. So this is from um, the late 1990s as we approached the year 2000. And uh, in his encyclical letter, John Paul II, in Novo Millennio in UNA, <laughs> Um, says this about prayer and the need for prayer among the laity and, uh, and in our parishes and Christian communities. So he says, it would be wrong to think that ordinary Christians can be content with a shallow prayer that is unable to fill their whole life. Our Christian communities, and I think here he, he thinks about parishes primarily, our Christian communities must become genuine schools of prayer where the meeting with Christ is expressed not just imploring help, but also in thanksgiving, praise, adoration, contemplation, listening, and ardent devotion until the heart truly falls in love. Then he goes on a little bit later. This great mystical tradition of the church shows how prayer can progress as a genuine dialogue of love to the point of rendering the person wholly possessed by the divine beloved, vibrating at the spirit's touch, resting filially as a son or daughter within the father's heart. So we see this great call from St. John Paul II of our communities to be schools of prayer. And uh, that's part of this contemplative revolution that's going on. And I would say that people who are sort of in path with this, in line with this, who, who are making time for prayer, who are going deep in prayer wherever they're found, uh, it's often through Carmelites. Uh, Carmelites seem to have, have a little role in sparking this fire for interior prayer and helping people go deeper with it. And so that's why in uh, the title for this talk, I, I emphasize or I note the Carmelite contribution to it, the Carmelite contemplative revolution among laity. You know, just some evidence of this, there's this wonderful book called Fire Within uh, by Father Thomas Dubé. And uh, Fire Within, Ignatius Press prints it. Um, the subtitle is uh, Fire Within, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, and the Gospel on Prayer. Um, so he's looking at, you know, especially the, the two Carmelites, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, but also the Gospel, showing that uh, they're not doing anything <laughs> extra than the Gospel. 
uh, they're just opening up the gospel before our eyes. And what we find in the scriptures, the word of God, and what the Lord is calling to us by way of intimacy and prayer. And so uh, this book uh, is so widely read. I think this is a little sign of this contemplative revolution that Haggerty sees that uh, St. John Paul II uh, seems to be calling for uh, as well. And uh, I know this little book, you know, it's been, it's read by Carmelites, of course. Uh, it's used a lot. I, I met some Franciscans uh, from Fort Wayne. They use it in their formation. Um, lay people I meet all the time who say, yeah, that book changed my life. Um, and even among the Protestants, there's a, a, a movement of prayer called the International House of, of Prayer. And they're actually doing a lot from the Catholic tradition. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And uh, this book is standard reading for them as well. Um, Thomas Dubé on this Carmelite spirituality, especially as expressed by Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross. And so, um, yeah, the Carmelites tend to help spark this contemplative revolution. And it is worth noting that, you know, oftentimes the Carmelite spirituality um, seems to be, people can kind of think of it as just like a spirituality of the heights or something, like for the spiritually elite or something. Because uh, you do have giants, right? And the giants in prayer in the Carmelite tradition, John the Cross, Teresa of Avila, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, St. Um, Edith Stein, uh, some great giants. Uh, but just to note that their writings are accessible to everyone. Part of the reason that the church names someone a doctor of the church uh, is that they're a doctor of the universal church. Uh, they don't have just teachings for this or that group, uh, but they have a message for the whole church. Um, and so a number of these Carmelites are doctors of the church, Teresa, John, uh, little Therese. Um, and, you know, we know St. Teresa of Avila, she was certainly, <laughs> she did fly high, right, uh, in prayer, but she was also known for being so rooted and down to earth, so rooted and down to earth. Uh, it's interesting, too, that St. John of the Cross his treatise uh, on living the living flame of love uh, here in the collected works um, published by Carmelites, the Institute of Carmelite Studies. Uh, John of the Cross, his kind of loftiest treatise, Living Flame of Love, is addressed to a laywoman. At the beginning, uh, he says, I'm writing this at, at the request of a lady, so and so, I forget who it was. Uh, but you know, he's having a conversation with this laywoman about her, you know, her prayer life. They've been in dialogue. Uh, and he writes this treatise for her, dedicates it to her, a laywoman, his, you know, his loftiest treatise. So that's significant. That says something. He didn't mean it just for Carmelites. He didn't mean it just for cloister nuns. Um, it, has, it has something to say for this, to this laywoman as well, to all laity. We can think of St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, a more modern saint. Uh, she was just canonized maybe four or five years ago. Uh, she died 1906 or so. Um, and she has a number of letters where she's writing her sister, Margaret, or Gweet, uh, as she calls her for short. And Gweet uh, is a married woman. Uh, she has two children. And so, you know, she's in the, the mayhem of the household <laughs> raising these children. And St. Elizabeth, you know, Sister Elizabeth of the Trinity, her blood sister, you know, her sister in, in the Carmel, writes her, sharing with her about Carmelite spirituality sharing with her uh, how she too, her sister Gweed, can find the Lord living in the depths of her soul and commune with him throughout her busy day as she's caring for her children. Uh, how she's bringing the, the heights of Carmelite spirituality to her, her, her sister, who's a lay woman. Another little sign. And we all know how St. Therese of Lisieux has, has charmed the heart of the world. And uh, how, how many people, right, have, have read St. Therese and have been touched and influenced by her? This is another sign about this contemplative revolution that's, that's happening. And I think about, right, the, Car the Carmelite scapular, uh, that that almost became universal. Uh, that's almost a sign for what Carmelite spirituality is. It kind of, there's, there's something in it for everyone. Everyone can learn something from it. And that's brown scapular that people wear, you know, it's, it hangs above the heart. Um, and that's often where Carmelites touch us. Sometimes I like to say, you know, I have a Dominican mind, Dominican intellect, and a Carmelite heart. Uh, and I think, uh, yeah, everyone is supposed to have something of that tenderness of the Carmelite heart. Um, 
you know, and it can come from other places to other sources. People can read that can get, get into prayer. But I'm just saying, oftentimes the Carmelites have a, a special role in this, in people's lives. And just to note, um, a special Dominican connection to, to Carmelites, um, since I am a Dominican and influenced by the Carmelites. It's interesting. So uh, John Towler, uh, he was a Dominican of the 1300s. Um, and he wrote a lot about the life of prayer and going deep in the life of prayer. And um, his works were translated uh, into Spanish. Okay, so I'm, I'm building up to an argument that uh, John Towler, this Dominican, influenced St. John of the Cross. Okay, so um, you can find traces of John Towler's thought in John of the Cross, like the Dark Nights, uh, you can find in John Towler, even like the Dark Night of the Spirit even. Um, the three signs on passing from meditation to contemplation that are so, so important for John of the Cross, you can also find in John Towler. Uh, but yeah, so, so get this, historical fact, John Towler, his works were translated into Spanish uh, like 1550. And then uh, some of his other works were translated into Latin like two years later. So that means when John of the Cross was like eight or 10, uh, John Towler was translated into Spanish and also Latin, which means when uh, St. John of the Cross was training to be a priest when he was in seminary, uh, it's almost a given that those books would be available in uh, St. John of the Cross's seminary library. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I'm convinced uh, because of those two things, finding traces of his, his, his thought, John Towler's thought in John of the Cross. Uh, but then also just the timing of the text becoming available in Latin and in Spanish um, around the time of John of the Cross, you know, before John's maturity or even before his time in seminary. Um, so yeah, there, there's a link there. We can think of Teresa of Avila. She had many spiritual directors um, and some are Dominicans. Domingo Banez uh, was an important theologian of, of her day and she was a, he was a spiritual director of Teresa of Avila. We fast forward to... Um, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, when she was a young woman about to enter Carmel, um, she was in contact and had as a spiritual director, a, a Dominican, a pair of ballet. Um, and uh, it's funny, Teresa of Avila, or not, sorry, Elizabeth of the Trinity had this strong conviction that uh, the Trinity dwelled in her soul. So she goes to Father Valet and wants some confirmation on this. Like, is she on the right track? Is she dreaming all this or what's going on? And as she recounts it, <laughs> the Dominicans started on this theme, Pair uh, Valet started on the theme of the indwelling Trinity by grace and, and the soul of the baptized in the state of grace. And he starts on it and he goes like two hours. He goes two hours. He can't, he, he starts on the theme. You know, he's, he's building on it. He's building the, the doctrine. He just keeps going. And uh, Teresa of, or Elizabeth is like, you know, the poor man just kept speaking. <laughs> I just wanted a little confirmation that I was on the right path. Uh, but isn't that so Dominican? <laughs> isn't that so Dominican? Uh, you get the Dominican going and uh, he'll go. He'll go. Um, on the at the pulpit uh, teaching. So yeah, so Dominican connection to the Carmelites. And then uh, in the early to mid 1900s, there's a renewal of spiritual theology. And that's led by you know, a name that probably a lot of you are familiar with, Father Garrigou Lagrange, Dominican. Um, and his um, mentor was Juan Aaron Taro, who now is the servant of God. We have his relic actually at the Dominican House of Studies, uh, Juan Aaron Taro. Um, so Juan Aaron Taro writes a two volume work, Mystical Evolution, about the development uh, in the mystical life, the, the Christian life. Uh, spiritual life, um, and then Gary de Lagrange comes after him uh, and writes the three ages of the spiritual life. And sort of the project of all of these people, and later a Dominican, oh, closer to our own time, Jordan Allman will take up the task and continue the project. I think he died like 2008 or so. Um, so these Dominicans, their project is to draw together St. Thomas Aquinas with the great mystical tradition, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross. Everyone, <laughs> Ignatius of Loyola, Francis de Sales. And so Gerard de Lagrange is very interesting, right? Because as a philosopher and as a theologian, uh, frankly, he can be like a little, a little narrow. 
you know, some people describe him as like belonging to the strict observance of Thomism. Uh, very, very kind of, kind of very narrow in a way, uh, which, you know, has its advantages. Um, but when you, when Gary Lagrange comes to spiritual theology, great breath, great breath. He's not limiting himself just to Dominicans, uh, Dominican spirituality. Uh, he wants everything. He wants to take the best of, of what's out there from everyone. Um, and so he focuses, as well as Juan Aaron Terrell before him, uh, they focus on John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, but every, you know, they draw on everyone. And so in my mind and heart, I mean, that's, that's kind of the model I try to follow as well as a Dominican, um, taking the best of, you know, we're, we're all on the same team, uh, the Catholic Church, and finding what, what works for me, what helps me, and then drawing the best from anywhere I can find it in the Catholic tradition. Um, and even you get like a Thomas like Jock Maritain, who's very interested in John the Cross as well, and writes on him, uh, the, the three, uh, or the modes, modes of knowledge, or the uh, three, three, I forget the name exactly, it slips me right now. Okay, so we have this in the mid, early to, early to mid 1900s. We have this great interest in John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, um, and then that, that spreads as well. Um, so that's <laughs> kind of by way of intro, although we're halfway into to the talk. Um, but yeah, no, those are some of the main points I, I, I wanna make. So let's, um, you know, let's dive into like the Carmelite, the origins of the Carmelite order. Um, so, you know, when we speak of Carmelite spirituality, normally we think of um, the Carmelites of the discounts, the OCDs, order of Carmelites, of the, dis, you know, the discounts Carmelites, the reform uh, movement. But actually, you know, the, in the 1500s, but actually the Carmelites were founded uh, in the 1200s, St. Simon Stock. He's the one who received the brown scapular and the, the brown scapular promises as well. Uh, and then the Carmelites, so they're actually, they're part of the friar movements. So in the 1200s, you have five friar movements uh, that, that spring up. Dominicans, uh, the most important, <laughs> followed closely by uh, the Franciscans. Um, but then the Carmelites are part of the, the friar movements, friar movement. You know, we might think of them more as monastic, um, but no, they're, they're part of the, the friar movement. Um, and then we have the, uh, the, the last two are lesser known and kind of smaller now, the Trinitarians. And I think that the Mercedarians uh, were the, the, the fifth one. But yeah, so the, the Carmelites, um, they're part of the friar movement. Um, and they would actually, I guess by legend or just in spirit, they claim uh, Elijah as their founder. So Elijah on Mount Carmel. Um, apparently, you know, formed a group of hermits around him. Um, and so a key thing for them is, you know, that beautiful encounter that Elijah had with the Lord. Not in the thunder, not in the fire, not in the trumpet blast, but in the still small voice. And so the Carmelite, there's that emphasis on silence, uh, encountering the Lord uh, in, in silent prayer. Uh, that's been there from the beginning. Um, and they, I think their motto is, or this is a, a line very important from them, and uh, it's from the lips of Elijah, I have been very zealous for the Lord. I have been very zealous for the Lord. Um, and yeah, it seems like with the Carmelites, a part of this zeal is zeal for the salvation of souls. And that is something distinctive. Uh, you know, I was with the Carthusians for, for six years. Um, and you know, they're certainly open to their, their prayers, uh, working for the salvation of souls, working for the spiritual good of souls, mm -hmm. but it's not an emphasis for them. Um, there were many chat, like the, all the, you know, we would almost have like a monthly chapter talk and uh, from the prior. And um, I was always expecting at some point to like have some kind of fervorino, like, you know, souls are counting on us here. You know, our faithfulness to the life of prayer, the faithfulness to the monastic life, souls are counting on us. I always like, I was always expecting something like that, uh, but no, never, never heard it, never heard it. Um, and again, not to say that they don't care about <laughs> the salvation of souls or they don't, you know, they're not aware of their prayers being affected for salvation of souls, but it's not as front and center um, as it is for the Carmelites. So it is something distinctive about the, the Carmelites. 
And it is something that kind of draws them close to, to the Dominicans as well, you know, our charism of preaching and the salvation of souls. Um, and so that, yeah, that longing that's for uh, desire for the salvation of souls. And you find that Teresa of Avila, you know, she's like an apostle uh, in her writings and just her, her yearning for souls. Um, so that, that was very important. And, and, you know, the Carmelite men, they did have active apostolates. You know, they weren't um, just, you know, they'd have a lot of time for prayer, but they would also go out and draw on the cross. He would do like catechesis uh, with young children even, a lot of spiritual direction, uh, a lot of celebrating masses, you know, going um, to you know, nearby areas, preaching. Um, it was, you know, like his mornings were given to prayer and then afternoons uh, he would, you know, do some of these active uh, apostolate sort of things. Um, so yeah, so they're, you know, part of the friar movement. So that, that makes sense. A key element of the Carmelite spirituality um, is the two times a day of having a large period of mental prayer. So an hour of mental prayer sometime in the first half of the day and in the morning, you know, as you wake up, and then a second hour uh, sometime in the, the latter half of the day. So that was kind of, that's core to uh, Carmelite spirituality, that time of mental prayer, which is, you know, a little more spontaneous. You might open up the scriptures before you. Um, you might have some spiritual reading, but, you know, enter into that silent, loving gaze uh, upon the Lord, simplicity in prayer. So that's very important for the Carmelites. It's worth noting that the Dominicans, too, uh, for most of our existence, um, for centuries, our rule had us do uh, two times a day of mental prayer for 30 minutes. So, you know, you would have 30 minutes of mental prayer in the morning and then 30 minutes at some time in the evening time. Um, with the Second Vatican Council and the reform after that, now our, our rule says, our constitutions say um, at least 30 minutes. Uh, and so it's not, it's not requiring the, the two times of 30 minutes. Um, but, you know, it does say not, you know, 30 minutes exactly. It says at least 30 minutes. So it's nice. It leaves that openness, you know, for someone who wants to do the two 30 minutes or even if you can find time the two, you know, longer or whatever. So, um, so just for the Carmelites, that's key. These um, two one hour times of mental prayer. Um, first part of the day and then a little later at some point. Um, and then, of course, for the Carmelites, uh, Mary. Is very important. We see that in the, the scapular, Mary giving the brown scapular to St. Simon Stock. But we, you see it all throughout Carmelite spirituality. You know, they refer to their habit as, you know, you can hear Elizabeth of the Trinity like talking about receiving Mary's habit. Uh, so they, they see Elijah as kind of a model for their prayer, their spirituality, but Mary uh, as well. Um, Mary, her um, openness to the Lord, her meditating on the mysteries of Christ in her heart. Um, yeah, a Marian uh, spirituality as well. And uh, Jesus remains at the center for them as well. Jesus is very much front and center. St. Teresa of Avila is strong on that point. So there's a simplicity to Carmelite spirituality, even in austerity, austerity. Um, but kind of the Marian element adds a sweetness to it all. You know, just think of St. Therese's devotion to Our Lady and just that warmth of affection that comes out. Um, so that's, you know, that goes back to the origins. And then in the 1500s, you have the reform movement. Teresa of Avila begins it, and then John of the Cross, it joins ranks with her on the, the men's side of it. Um, and so, yeah, oftentimes when we think about Carmelite spirituality, now we think of the, the discalced Carmelites. Um, it's interesting. For a while, I wondered, you know, a young man who's, you know, entering a vocation to religious, like, priesthood, zealous. Uh, how could anyone, like, join the, <laughs> the oak arms and not the reform movement? It just, like, always puzzled me how that could be. Well, I received an answer, not this last summer, but the summer before. I was sitting in um, Sacred Heart Cathedral in Newark, New Jersey, and I'm sitting there praying, and then I see, um, like, three or, three or four Carmelites come in. I, you know, I, I recognize the Carmelite habit. They have, you know, their brown habit, but also the white cape over it. A young Carmelite, and so I go up and talk to them, and they're taking pictures or something. I go up and talk to them, and it, it turns out that, like, the two or three uh, just made their simple profession. They just finished their novitiate and finished, you know, made their simple profession. Um, and so we're talking, and it comes out that 
Uh, they're part of the original Carmelite. They're not the OCD, the Carmelite of Discalced Carmelites. Uh, they're the original Carmelite. They're part of that. And so I'm, I'm like intrigued by this. And you know, I can tell they're, they're on fire. And so I don't know what, what question I ask. But anyways, they keep on stressing, yes, we're Carmelites of the primitive observance. <laughs> we're Carmelites of the primitive observance. Uh, we're Carmelites of the primitive observance. Uh, and so I guess that's how it works, right? It, it's, you don't think of yourself as like the unreformed Carmelites. You're the, the Carmelites of the primitive observance. And, uh, and I did ask them, I said, you know, in your formation, like, do you read uh, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, and you know, uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity, uh, Edith Sign? And they said, oh, yeah, sure. You know, that's part of our charism. That belongs to us as well. Um, and so, yeah, so there's, my, there's the answer to the question I had for a while. And it makes sense. It makes sense. Um, so, okay. Um, and just one, you know, one Carmelite that's often not thought of, uh, but who is a Carmelite, was a Brother Lawrence, who wrote The Practice of the Presence of God. Um, and his years at the moment escaped me, but I think he was before the Discalce. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but anyways, that spirituality of the practice of the presence of God does capture something uh, important about the Carmelite spirituality. I mean, it's something we're all called to as well, um, but that uh, emphasis also in the Carmelite spirituality. Okay, so now let's let's dive into quickly uh, just some of the, the key figures and just, um, you know, I'm just going straight to things that I think can help us, uh, straight to things that I think can help us. Um, right after I say one more thing. So if you look at this slide, um, there are, as spiritual theologians think about the life of prayer, um, it's common to speak of like nine grades of prayer or nine stages of prayer, starting with vocal prayer, meditation, effective prayer, prayer simplicity. And so, you know, prayer becomes uh, more and more simple as you move on, more affective. Um, and then more and more God's activity takes over. So infused contemplation, um, you know, so these Dominicans um, in the early 10th, Hundreds, uh, um, Juan Artero, Gary de Lagrange. Uh, their big thing is every person, every baptized person is called to the mystical life. Um, it's a universal call to the mystical life. And by mysticism, they, they don't mean uh, like visions or the extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, they mean the essential element of like intimacy with the Lord and experiential knowing and loving of the Lord, uh, passivity or rather a receptivity of God's activity in prayer. Um, so it's interesting if you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, paragraph 2014, 2014, um, it speaks about mysticism there in the Catechism. And you see the work of these Dominicans in the early to mid 1900s. You see that work. Uh, being verified by the catechism. And you know, the catechism written in 1994 puts its stamp of approval on that whole movement and the universal call to mysticism. So if you read that paragraph closely and you have in mind the background, the development of what's taking place in spiritual theology with the Dominicans, uh, Gary Lagrange and so forth, you, you see that it's addressing those things and it's talking about the mystical life, everyone's called to that participation in the mystery of Christ, uh, to the intimacy with the Lord, to the heights of perfection. Uh, so anyway, so that's paragraph 2014 of the Catechism. And so, uh, you know, these spiritual theologians speak about infused contemplation as the beginning of the mystical life. Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to predominate in prayer, the gift of understanding, which St. Thomas says gives us a deeper penetration into the truth. The gift of understanding begins to take over. You get a deeper penetration of what you've been meditating on, even as it might take you beyond words. Uh, and then the gift of wisdom, uh, which for St. Thomas uh, builds on charity and is an affective knowing of the love, of knowing of the Lord, uh, an experiential knowledge of God. St. Thomas says in a tasting of God, uh, a sweet knowledge of God. These are all words that St. Thomas applies to the gift of wisdom. Um, and so that begins to predominate. You know, all the baptized have all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we grow in them. Uh, there are mystical acts. Um, but as 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit begin to predominate, uh, then begins, um, then you, you call the, you know, the person has entered the mystical life, so to speak. Um, and then there's prayer of quiet, prayer of union, uh, prayer of conforming union or spiritual betrothal, uh, prayer of transforming union, spiritual marriage. And so, yeah, the great thing about these Dominican spiritual theologians is that they draw in like St. Catherine of Siena as she describes spiritual marriage, uh, as she describes, um, you know, what happens when Christ appeared to her and gave, and they had the exchange of hearts, St. Catherine of Siena speaking, um, with the Lord. Uh, and so anyway, so yeah, these are kind of the nine grades of prayer drawn from Teresa of Avila, uh, but also, you know, it encompasses other spiritual writers as well. And it's interesting, uh, St. Pius X, uh, in a letter in 1914, maybe it's 1904, I forget exactly, but he, he talks about these nine grades of prayer drawn from Teresa of Avila and basically says, um, yeah, they have universal application. This applies to every Christian's uh, spiritual life. Uh, these nine grades of prayer. And so, yeah, that's a nice detail to have like papal approbation <laughs> on what St. Teresa of Avila teaches and uh, to say that, you know, yeah, it's for all, all Christian believers. Um, okay, so now really into uh, just some key, um, key insights from these Carmelite greats that I think can help us in the spiritual life. Um, Teresa of Avila, Oh, and I, oh, shoot, <laughs> I'm just realizing too, I want to get some time for questions. Um, so let me just, yeah, get the key key points for, for, um, for each, for these people. You know, Teresa of Avila, I think something important we can draw from her is that as we advance in prayer, uh, it becomes more and more about loving, uh, more and more about loving uh, than knowing. Uh, not that knowing gets dropped off the map or that, you, you know, knowledge doesn't have a, a role anymore. Uh, but loving, uh, you know, loving uh, becomes more the emphasis in prayer. Um, oh, I just lost it. Yeah. Um, loving becomes more the emphasis of prayer. Um, so St. Teresa of Avila says, oh, yeah. So Teresa of Avila has that beautiful definition of prayer as um, you know, just the intimate converse with God, that spiritual friendship with God, speaking to God as, as to a friend. And then she says, you know, prayer, mental prayer is nothing other than being aware of whom it is that we address, who we are, who are doing the speaking and what we're asking for. So prayer for Teresa of Avila is about like an awareness of what we're doing, who you know, the majesty of the Lord that we, we are approaching, the lowliness and the sinfulness of ourselves. Um, and this awareness in our prayer, you know, that's mental prayer going deeper in that. Um, and then just, so, yeah, let's look at this quote here from Teresa of Avila. Um, and he says, she says to her, writing to her sisters um, that, you know, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you all don't know what love is. <laughs> uh, perhaps we don't know what love is. I wouldn't be very surprised because it doesn't consist in great delight, but in desiring with strong determination to please God in everything, in striving, and in asking him for the advancement of the honor and glory of his son and of the Catholic Church, these are the signs of love. And St. Teresa says, at other times, these souls would be right if they engaged for a while in making acts of love, praising God, rejoicing in his goodness, that he is who he is, and in desiring his honor and glory. Um, and so, so, yeah, love is not like a delightful feeling. Um, although sometimes it can include that, but this desiring with strong determination, a striving, a desiring, um, you know, movement towards the Lord. Uh, and then uh, down here, we see some examples of what, you know, as prayer becomes more about loving than knowing what that all looks like, it can include acts of love, praising God, rejoicing in his goodness, that he is who he is. You know, so, you know, all you uh, Aristotelians out there, uh, you know that it, it's part of love. Uh, if you think about the 11 appetites, uh, 11 passions of Aristotle that St. Thomas picks up as well, and St. John of the Cross follows as well, um, especially the, the, the four main ones, um, desire, hope, uh, fear, and despair. Um, I don't know, sadness, sadness for the last one. Okay, anyways, um, we know that Part of love, when, when love uh, rests in the, in the good thing it desires, um, it rejoices in it. 
right? Joy is the result of resting in the good. When our wills come to rest in the good, joy is a result. And so something like just rejoicing in God's presence, that's an act of love. Resting uh, in, in God, in his presence, that's, that's part of what Teresa of Avila means by um, our prayer becoming more and more about loving. Because yeah, for a while, <laughs> uh, anyways, that, I was, anyways, I was trying to figure out, yeah, what's, what's all involved in these acts of love? And um, yeah, so it involves resting in him, delighting in the Lord. Those two are acts, acts of love. That's Teresa of Avila, something very important that we can learn from her. Um, St. John of the Cross. Yeah, let's just, let's just talk about this. He has these famous three signs. So, you know, he wants, uh, what are signs that the Lord is moving in our prayer life and where we should yield more to uh, what God is doing in our soul and we should become more and more receptive rather than um, so much activity in our prayer. And then, so these are some of the three, uh, th these are the three signs. Um, and they show up a number of times in John the Cross's works, uh, Dark Night, uh, book one, chapters eight through 13. And again, uh, and before that, they show up a Santa Mount Carmel, uh, book two, chapters 12 through, through 15. Um, and then they show up in the sayings of light and love. And so this is a very brief way to talk about it. There are three signs of inner recollection. First, a lack of satisfaction in passing things. Second, a liking for solitude and silence and an attentiveness to all that is more perfect. Third, the considerations, meditations, and acts that formerly help the soul now hinder it, and it brings to prayer no other support than faith, hope, and love. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to see these expanded more, you can go to these other, other treatises or go to uh, Thomas Dubay, uh, Fire With Them, and he gives a good account of these things. Okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, just fast forwarding uh, really quickly. Edith Stein, uh, St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross. So here's a picture of Edith Stein as, as a student. Um, I love as a student, she said she would begin um, each day going before the Lord and receiving her mission from the Lord. You know, she was working on this dissertation, reading this. And so she had a basic idea of what her vocation was calling her to, but like the specific thing, like what to apply herself to the day. Uh, she would seek the Lord's face at the beginning of the day in prayer and receive this mission from the Lord. And then as she went through her day, uh, she would carry that out. So, you know, great, great advice there. Great advice there. Um, and she's so great because she draws out kind of the intellectual side uh, of, of Carmelite spirituality or, you know, Carmelite spirituality coming into contact with the intellectual life even more. Uh, so she said, you know, when she was... Um, in grad school, you know, my desire for the truth was one sole prayer. Uh, yeah, so our seeking the truth, our studying the truth uh, can be prayer as well. And just a beautiful line here, what was not included in my plan, uh, plans lay in God's plan. Um, and so we see St. Teresa Benedicta, uh, that Carmelite spirituality, that surrender, uh, bring Bringing her to the surrender of her love and martyrdom. Um, so that's a beautiful, I think a lot of Carmelites desired martyrdom and it came true in her case, but that interior self offering to the Lord is so key. How, whatever and whatever the Lord wants to do with that. Uh, however, he wants that uh, sacrificial offering uh, to, uh, to be spent. Um, okay, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity, I talked about Father Valet. And just, I already mentioned this, you know, she wrote to her, her sister Gweet a lot about um, finding um, the indwelling Trinity and praying to the Trinity throughout her day. Uh, and then St. Elizabeth at the end of her life uh, says, and I realize I'm not going in chronological order exactly. Uh, St. Elizabeth at the end of her life says, I think that in heaven, my mission will be to draw souls by helping them to go out of themselves in order to cling to God by a holy and simple loving movement and to keep them in this great silence, which will allow God to communicate himself to them and to transform them into to himself. So St. Elizabeth of the Trinity promises us that as she's up in heaven, she's, she's going to help souls uh, enter into this deeper recollection uh, to go out of themselves in order to cling to God by a holy, simple, and loving movement. 
and to uh, keep us in, the, in this silence before the Lord, which will allow God to communicate himself to us and to transform us into the image of Christ. Um, and so part of the contemplative revolution, we have, you know, writings of Elizabeth of the Trinity, but we also have her intercession for us, her prayer for us. And she made this promise to help us and to help souls today. And so we ask her for continued prayers along these lines. And I'm going to end with, uh, of course, you know, everyone's, or maybe not everyone's favorite, but, you know, a lot of people's favorite, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux. And we learned from St. Therese, you know, the childlike surrender, simplicity, littleness. Um, and we find in St. Therese, too, this great desire for the salvation of souls. And so I want to read this uh, quotation here from Story of, of a Soul. Uh, she says, oh, Jesus, why can't I tell all little souls how unspeakable is your condescension? I feel that if you found a soul weaker and littler than mine, which is impossible, you would be pleased to grant it still greater favors, provided it abandoned itself with total confidence to your infinite mercy. But why do I desire to communicate your secrets of love, O oh Jesus? For was it not you alone who taught them to me? And can you not reveal them to others? Yes, I know it. And I beg you to do it. I beg you to cast your divine glance upon a great number of little souls. I beg you to choose a legion of little victims worthy of your love. Yeah, so we know St. Therese promised to do, spend her heaven doing good for us on earth. And part of it was uh, being drawn into this legion, this army of little souls. Uh, great trust in the Lord. A great surrender, childlike simplicity before the Lord in our prayer life, in our, our life as a whole. And so we count on St. Therese as well. Uh, for this contemplative revolution. Um, and so just kind of my final fervorino, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, there was a spiritual, whoops, okay, there's a spiritual writer in the, the 1950s or 60s. And uh, he pointed out, he, he saw the coming decades. He saw that already in the 50s and 60s that um, the cultural Catholicism was already kind of losing its, its, its strength, you know, overall as a broad, you know, overall, um, you know, we still try to build the Catholic culture and that, but he, he saw, he saw what was going to happen in the next decades. He foresaw it. And he said, you know, the Christian of the future is either going to be a mystic or he's not going to be at all. And what he meant by that is the Christian of the future, namely the Christian of our time, there's going to have to be something experiential about the, the faith, something that we claim as our own and personally, uh, there's going to have to be a more personal dimension to it, uh, not just something that's kind of been handed on to us, but something that we have to make our own. And there's going to be something experiential to it. The Christian of the future of our time is either going to be a mystic or not be at all. And we see our Catholic, you know, Catholic Church is uh, closing. Um, and so I think this contemplative revolution uh, is important, uh, not just for individual souls, although you know, that's enough in itself, but it is important for um, the future of the church. Uh, people want contact with the Lord and we can bring them that contact with the Lord only if we ourselves first have that contact and intimate uh, personal union with him in our times of prayer. And so, yeah, I just encourage all of us to, to make time for that, that silent prayer before the Lord. And if you find it like a struggle, well, you know, pick up Thomas Dubé, Fire Within, or some of these, these other uh, spiritual writers. But make time for the Lord. He's worthy of it. He's worthy of it. And then find like-minded people to encourage on this path. Because the contemplative revolution is not just an individual thing. It involves all of us. Thank you. So we'll open it up to questions now. Okay, thank you, Father Ignatius. Um, so like we did last week, if you would uh, have a question, if you could type it in the chat box, um, in the, the Zoom chat box, I realize those who are only on phones, audio calls can't do that. Um, but for everyone else, uh, if you could type something in the chat box and, and Father Ignatius, I'll just kind of be monitoring that and, and uh, throw some questions your way as they, they pop up in the chat. Um, I 
Okay, first one simple clarificatory question. Who was the writer who said that Christians of the future would be a mystic or not at all? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to keep that one to myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, it's a thinker who, who's insightful at times, but other times lacks insight. So, okay, gotcha. So, you don't want to just send people that author's way. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Uh, question, what are top three books that Father would recommend to begin reading the Carmelites? Yeah, a good, very good question. Very good question. Um, so yeah, the first one, and I think that is the most accessible, is the Thomas Dubé, uh, Fire Within. Uh, Ignatius Press, you know, it's been out for like 25, 30 years. Um, and then after that, um, Blessed Pair Marie Eugene. Um, I flipped, you know, through in my slideshow, I had a little picture of him. He was beatified, actually, in the past maybe five years or so. But he wrote a two-volume work uh, called I Want to See God is the first volume. The second volume is uh, I Am a Daughter of the Church. And he's, he's doing, he's, he calls it a practical synthesis of John the Cross and Teresa of Avila. But he also draws in uh, Therese of Lisieux a lot in there as well and some other uh, Carmelites, like Western known ones. Um, but that's a good, um, a good way to go deep as well uh, with the Carmelites and, you know, a good introduction. Um, and then apart from that, I would suggest there's a nice book by, it's called The Impact of God. And uh, it's by Father Matthew Ian, I-A-I-N. I think it was written in maybe the 90s or something. Um, but his big point is that the presupposition and John the Cross of spirituality uh, is that uh, we have a God who's, who's pressing in to bestow uh, his blessing upon us. God is pressing in on us um, to bestow a blessing upon us. Um, and so we need to create space for him. And so all the talk of emptiness and like John the Cross uh, the nada, the nothing, uh, is to create space for the God who's pressing in to bestow. Um, and so he's good at kind of opening up some underlying presuppositions of John the Cross's uh, spirituality and other kind of Carmelite spirituality. Um, so yeah, those are good, good, good introductions. Okay, thank you. Someone else talks about the artistic work of painting, the transverberation, uh, yeah, transverberation of St. Teresa of Avila. Um, please explain what is meant by transverberation. <laughs> right. So that's when um, Teresa of Avila was pierced through her heart uh, by, uh, so, okay, so a seraph, the angel, you know, seraphim angel appeared uh, to St. Teresa of Avila with a burning uh, spear in her hand. And she, uh, she pierces the heart of Teresa of Avila. Um, and so I think this was like the moment of spiritual patrol doll or something. Um, and, um, and then so Teresa's heart is like wounded in a deeper way, wounded with love uh, by this, this piercing, <laughs> this transverberation of this, this, this seraphim. It's interesting, like the Carmelites within the order, they have a special feast day uh, on the day that this happened. And it's called the Feast of the Transverberation of uh, St. Teresa of, of, of Avila. Um, and so there's artwork that depicts that. There's also um, the famous statue, so famous I can't remember the author's, the uh, artist's name. Uh, if someone knows it, and you can write in the comment box. Is it um, Bernini? Bernini? I don't know. Uh, but Teresa of, of Avila in Ecstasy is a famous piece of art about Teresa of Avila. And for, yeah, Bernini. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Okay. So I can trust my memory. Um, okay. Okay. Um, someone asked, you know, do you know the current differences between the Discalced and the uh, original Carmelites at, at, the, at the present time? Yeah, no, I don't know much about, you know, my only exposure to the, the Ocarms um, in a living way I was those three novices, you know, who just made simple profession uh, last, last summer. Uh, yeah, I don't know much, much about them. How about this? I think a lot of people have a sense when they hear about yeah, John of the Cross and, and Teresa of Avila and some of these folks that that almost like, like there's no point in trying to read them because they're going to be so beyond me. Yeah, I'm just going to be totally lost, blown away. It's, it's, 
will be nothing but frustrating, et cetera. Um, how, yeah, what would you say to, to someone who maybe is, is kind of feeling that way today? Right, right. Um, I would say that, you know, yeah, diving into like John the Cross, a cent amount caramel, not because it's so long, but just because it's so kind of dry and arid, uh, that, is, that can be very discouraging. So, and that's not, that's not the best place to start. Um, I mean, actually for John the Cross, Spiritual Canticle, I think is the best, best place to start. Um, if you're going to, you know, as you dive into his primary works, but I think the secondary works are a better way to get in, get a good introduction. Because you you can take, you know, there's less of a danger of it with Teresa, with Teresa of Sioux, Elizabeth of the Trinity, Teresa of Avila, especially John the Cross. You know, you can just read bits and pieces, and you get a you can get a wrong picture of things. Um, you can get a wrong picture of things, and so especially with John, I think uh, an introduction is important. Um, but yeah, I would say yeah, gives fire within uh, and a, a chance. If you haven't read Saint Therese, story story of a soul. Uh, that's a good introduction too, and you do get solid uh, Carmelite spirituality. You know, she's she's a daughter of John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. She's following their spirituality, uh, but she does make that more accessible um, to, to people, and does um, put it in a context of childlike faith and trust um, that should never be uh, be forgotten. Uh, you can you find that in Teresa of Avila as well, a littleness. Um, and like a childlike joy. Um, but yeah, St. Therese kind of brings it to a, a new development of that. Um, oh yeah, it's someone I see that's mentioned in the comment box, Jacques Philippe, Time for God is also a good intro that draws heavily from the Carmelites. Thank you, thank you, Monica. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I know, I've seen, you know, I know he's popular now, but honestly, I haven't read, <laughs> I haven't read him yet. And it, it's been on, it's been on my bookshelf for a while. Um, yeah, the Father Yamart's uh, book, St. Therese. Um, yep, I read some of that as well. And that, that does kind of give, it's more of a systematic approach to St. Therese. That was of the um, You know, and the newest Carmelite saint, Therese, or, uh, Elizabeth of the Trinity, uh, her letters are good because she's writing them a lot to her, her blood sister, who's a, who's a lay woman and, you know, is busy in the household with children and household duties. Uh, so that's also a good, good intro. Okay. And the less, less intimidating one. Excellent. Any other last minute questions for, for uh, Father Ignatius this evening? Okay. Once again, Father Ignatius, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation and the answers to your questions. And uh, for those who've uh, enjoyed tonight, uh, next week uh, we'll be uh, getting a, a presentation on Franciscan spirituality from a, a Franciscan priest who's a, a friend of mine who is uh, a native of Massachusetts, not too far, just a couple hours from here, but currently serving at a Franciscan parish uh, down in outside Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so next week will be the Franciscans. Uh, it'll be the same uh, Zoom link that you used to get on tonight. So you can just kind of keep that same link handy and we'll be using it again uh, next Monday, same time, same place. So for now, thank you everyone. God bless and good night. <laughs>